Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, you had a nice break. Um, and once again, welcome to Power Tool Summit this year. We are so excited. You are all here. Let's do a little round of applause. Um, welcome again. Um, my name is Sydney. For those of you who I haven't met, I am a PM on the PowerShell team, and I am joined today by some awesome rock stars here on stage. I've got the amazing the Jason Helmick. The Steven Booker. And our engineering manager, Steve Lee. Before we get started, I have been asked to make one very quick announcement, which is for the on-ramp folks, please head to the Everett room at 1 p.m. Awesome. Um, a few quick questions. Um, I know we asked these earlier, but I couldn't really see because I was in the back of the room. So um, how many first timers at the summit do we have this year? Wow, welcome. Yes, we are so excited you are here. And um, once again, how many people um, been here for every summit? I'm raising my hand, I'm, I have not missed every summit. <laughs> well, I heard this might be the best one yet, so we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but with that, um, Hey, the best part is this. I do this every year. Last November, PowerShell became 16 years old. So happy birthday to PowerShell, everybody. <laughs> Keep in mind that PowerShell is now legally old enough to drive a car. And I know some of you have been already programming your senseless with PowerShell for years now. So keep go forth and do, you know, keep going on. So it's all good. And you know what? I actually have a picture from 16 years ago when PowerShell uh -oh. was born. It's pretty cute, right? Yeah? Yeah? Um, I've been having a lot of fun with AI lately, but sometimes the results are a little bit weird. Um, anyone else been playing with AI lately? Yeah? Curious um, if anyone's incorporated it into their daily PowerShell workflow. Oh, a couple. A few, a few people. Well, there's been some awesome community modules that have come out um, related to AI. Um, I know Justin's in the house. He's, he's been working on one. And Doug Fink, don't believe is here, but also has one. Um, Steven was also around 16 years ago. Yeah, so um, to kind of start off, uh, you know, 16 years ago, the world was a messy place. Um, there's all sorts of different technologies out there and not something to glue it around. And well, 16 years ago, I'll be honest, I was eight years old. So you might think that I had no idea about the mess that this was, you know, happening, that I had no idea even what a computer was. Well, you'd be wrong, actually. So this was me in a data center Long before I was, <laughs> way longer than 16 years ago, but you know, I knew about the mess that was going on and you know, I could not clean it up. But thank God Windows PowerShell came around and was able to be the glue to bring all of these technologies together. Along came, along came, along came commandlets and consistency that uh, made discoverability easy enough and uh, create a consistent glue language that could bring all these technologies together. Oh, and that's actually, with PowerShell 1.0, in order to make PowerShell a usable tool, that a tool that would grow and extend and be able to support and solve, help you solve the problems that you need. Our, light, our tagline with PowerShell is to empower the folks in operations, right? So we want to be more successful. For that to happen, the team spent a lot of time focused on some tenants. There's a lot of background behind this, but you see it and feel it in PowerShell today. Everybody talks about it, the consistency, the security. So think about this. Every time a feature or an idea comes up and PowerShell needs to move forward, the team focuses in on these things so that the product builds and extends in a common way that we can all understand and, and use in our own solutions. So with Windows PowerShell, we provided you with a tool set. But alone, we didn't solve any problems. You took that tool set and you brought it into the real world and you solved real challenges. But it didn't end there because um, when Jeffrey invented PowerShell, he also and created a promise. He said, if you learned PowerShell, um, we will do everything we can to make it the best investment you've ever made. Now, you've probably heard this before. It's the sacred vow, and it's a really important part of PowerShell. Um, it's been a core commitment the PowerShell team has had since the beginning. 
It means that PowerShell will continue to evolve with you and with the technology um, to keep evolving this tool set and solving new problems. And this has been really important because the world didn't stop being chaotic and messy with Windows PowerShell. No, it got a lot messier. We had the advent of the cloud and new technologies like Azure and AWS and GCP and VMware. We started developing in cross-platform environments. We were working on uh, with Mac OS and Linux. We had the advent of DevOps and we were working with CI CD and with containers and new APIs. Um, we were connecting to remote machines in all new ways and dealing with configuration management and new technologies. And so the world got a lot messier and this called for new technology. And along came PowerShell 7, a new tool set to deal with evolving challenges in an evolving, chaotic, messy world. And that's the interesting thing, because even today with PowerShell 7, not only does the team sit around and still focus on those same tenets that made PowerShell successful originally, in other words, we still need to focus on things like security, extensibility, testability, serviceability. Everything we do needs to have an answer for all of those. So what's amazing about all of that is we still do this today, but the best part is it's not just us. Over the years since the beginning of PowerShell and with Jeffrey bringing it out and with the team talking about it, this is what you talk about. You come to us and tell us when we've made mistakes. You help us see clarity where we've had a few bumps in the road and you talk to each other about, well, is that gonna be consistent if you create that module? How about that? Is that secure? Is that, so you're using these same tenets and that's what makes this ecosystem work and that's what makes PowerShell, today, PowerShell 7 today heading in the same successful direction that Windows PowerShell did for so long. And once again, PowerShell 7 came along. We provided you with the tools, you took them into the real world, and you solved real problems with them. And then the story didn't end there because the PowerShell team remembered the sacred vow. We stayed committed to this idea, learn PowerShell, and we'll do everything we can to make it the best investment you've ever made. And this is important because the world stayed messy. It actually didn't stop there. And so now we're entering a new phase. So we're here today with PowerShell 7. We've helped clean up the mess that uh, you can see there in that, that, that circle. And we're now on a new advent of, of technology, disruptive technology, and all sorts of new things that people are going to have to deal with and work with uh, in the DevOps environment, in operations, uh, in just the whole developer world space. And so um, AI has, you know, the thing about disruptive technologies is it's going to make the world a lot messier before it makes it clean. And we know that. We've seen this happen a couple of times, and we see a bigger mess coming. Um, but the, the main message is that we want to bring, uh, we want you to be sure that PowerShell will stay consistent while looking forward to these new technologies in order to stay that glue language, that powerful language, uh, to keep these technologies uh, working together and keep the world running. Um, and so kind of uh, to show up, you know, we are pushing forward into the future with all of these new technologies and we're very excited about the new technologies uh, around AI and all sorts of other disruptive technologies of today. Um, so the main message is, you know, PowerShell is gonna stay consistent moving forward and we will continue to be forward looking towards the next mess that is gonna happen. And so how are we doing that, Jason? Well, it's, it is, it's pretty, it, We've been working on a lot of stuff over the last year. As a matter of fact, it's hard to read that slide. I can't read it from here, so I can't even point anything out, but I know that there's been a lot of PS read line work up there. There's some new stuff like JSON adapter where there's all kinds of things that we've been working on up there. And if you wanna see how, and this is all stuff that you've brought to us. You've told us about it, Steve's come up with it. It's come to us from Microsoft. It's come from the community. Just tons of stuff, but if you really wanted to have a detailed look at it, you can just go through our change logs. Right, Stephen? You can go through our change yeah, logs yeah, or something. We, yeah, we can, we can take a look there. So before we go through there, but like, uh, I wanted to highlight just our commitment to improving PowerShell. In the last year, we've had 27 different releases of PowerShell since April uh, of last year, since last year's summit, and eight of which are preview releases. And, and Jason, do you want to you see some of the change logs that we're doing? I mean, I think we can... Do you guys mind if we just read through all of these? I don't think it would take too long, oh, right? Oh, it's not done, is it? We, we, <laughs> I was told we have all day, so we can just keep going. No, I'm kidding. But um, we really want to emphasize that we are continuing to improve PowerShell. 
uh, work with the community uh, to uh, incorporate your guys' changes. And without you guys, I mean, if you do look closely, so many of these items have a thank you to uh, a GitHub handle to so many of the amazing community members that have contributed to PowerShell uh, and helped make it what it is today. Um, and we also want to emphasize our commitment to security, not only uh, you know, investing in, in security issues that pop up of the day, but also looking towards more, uh, bringing more security technologies to PowerShell to help emphasize uh, security in any uh, form. And the PowerShell team does not do it alone. We could probably do a whole presentation of all the amazing partners that we have, but we just wanted to highlight a few. Um, one partnership that's very important to us is our partnership with Azure. We work very closely with Azure PowerShell team, but also a lot of partners within Azure to bring together this cloud management experience. Um, we also work closely with the .NET team. We obviously take a huge dependency on .NET and bring in .NET previews into our PowerShell preview releases. We align our release cadence with the .NET team. We work with the um, OpenSSH in order to bring a consistent cross-platform um, remoting experience to you. And similarly, we work with the VS Code team to bring a really premier free cross-platform editing experience for PowerShell um, to all of you. Um, we'll demo this shortly, um, but we work with the Windows terminal team um, to make the terminal cool again on Windows um, and have some exciting new features there. Um, and of course, one of our biggest partnerships is with our open source community, um, which really has um, made so many improvements to PowerShell. And together, this is what makes PowerShell great. And with that comes the fun part of our presentation. It's demo time. Yes. Woo! <laughs> so it's time for us to show off some of the stuff we've been working on. Uh, let's see here. Let's start off. Can everyone see the screen OK? I can zoom in a little bit. Oh, I can't do that. Yep, yep. Okay, there we go. There we go. So uh, the first thing I'm going to briefly show off is uh, PowerShell Predictive IntelliSense. Um, you, we've seen this before, but we've had a number of improvements to it. Um, but as you see here, and you'll see it throughout all of our demos, so just so you don't get uh, worried about where this is coming from. So as I start typing, you'll see the kind of grayed out uh, uh, prediction uh, of what it's trying to uh, get. So it, um, right now you can enable this. This is in PS read line prediction source. Oh, it's type completion over. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thank you. Gosh, I am. Um, and there it is, predictive intelligence is helping me. Prediction source, there we go. Um, there we go, I'll enable history right now. So this grabs my history and enables you to uh, accelerate your, your console experience uh, to, you know, after you've run something successfully once, it can now, uh, as you're starting to type, it will match it to what you last typed and then you can accept with the right arrow key and uh, you know, be more quickly on your way. Uh, as you can see, it kind of helped me remember the commandlets, I, you know, scatterbrained being up here, but uh, I will be talking a lot more about this stuff later today in the shell enhancement sessions. I'll be diving more deeply into this as well as a number of other improvements, so be sure to check that out. Um, I think, who's next? That would be me. Hello, everyone. Um, so as you can see, we're using Windows Terminal. Windows Terminal is um, fast, efficient, powerful, and productive terminal, and um, it's very customizable with different um, themes, styles, and configurations. But Feature I love about Windows Terminal is, as you can see, we have this tab feature, which is actually very useful for us today because Steven and I wanted to have a little bit of a different setup for our demos. And so I'm gonna just go ahead and close his tab and use my tabs. Um, additionally, I would love it if I lived in an all PowerShell 7 world. Reality is I don't. I use Windows PowerShell and PowerShell 7 in my daily workflow which is really great because I can have tabs for both in my terminal. Um, and one thing I wanna to show today is new error views that we introduced in PowerShell 7. Um, if you open a Windows um, PowerShell terminal and you type in error view, you can see I'm using my predictors, you'll see normal view. And so your error view is customizable. Um, and if you've ever used PowerShell, um, and you've typed in something like 
get child item, say you used a path, um, and then maybe you've put in a bad path, say a path to nowhere, you've gotten this big block of red text. And I'm sure as PowerShell users, we've seen this big block of red text many times. Um, and it's a little bit hard to parse sometimes like what exactly is going wrong here, right? Um, and, or maybe um, I have a slightly different error. Um, maybe I didn't get my, had a little bit of a typo, didn't get my uh, parameter name quite right. Once again, big block of red text. Or maybe I have a different type of error. I divided, um, I did one divided by zero. Once again, big block of red text. Kind of hard to see exactly what's going on. If I flip over to PowerShell 7, Oh, font's a little small. Thank you. No. Thank you. Is that a little better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Successful. OK, um, so once again, error view. Um, we're now in PowerShell 7. You can see that we now have concise view. Um, so if I do a similar um, thing, like get child's item, um, let's say I have a path to nowhere. I get this simple one-liner, couldn't find path to nowhere because it does not exist. Similarly, let's say instead have a bad parameter name, path, a part instead of path, a parameter name cannot be found that matches. Really easy to read what's going on. One divided by zero, attempted to divide by zero, runtime exception. Um, now you might be thinking, this is great, but maybe I wanted a little bit more information. Um, I actually liked having a little more detail. Awesome. We created a commandlet that can get you more information. Get error. Gives you a full list of everything that's going on. Um, this also has a parameter, newest. Um, so let's say I wanted my last three errors. Um, it will provide them all. Um, this uh, new error view is especially useful, in my opinion, um, when you are running a script, say a script that has multiple errors. So if I run this multi-error view, you can see I got this really nice coloring, can tell me exactly what line the error was on, um, and uh, can see exactly what happened, attempted to divide by zero. Um, so that is the new error view. Um, one other uh, thing I wanted to demo for you today is secret management. So secret management is a module that's available on the PowerShell gallery today, and it's an extensible module that allows you to get and set secrets from various vault extensions using a single set of command lines. So I already have the module install installed, and one of the first things I like to do when I have um, a new module is run get command on it, just to see what I have available. So I'm gonna run get command module Microsoft PowerShell secret management, It's the name of the module, and you can see my commandlet interface here. So you can see I can get secrets, um, set secrets, and I have the ability to register secret vaults. So that's the first thing I'm gonna wanna do. Um, the power of secret management really comes from the vault ecosystem. So once I have secret vaults registered, then I can go ahead and start getting and setting secrets. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do before I register a secret vault is I'm gonna need to get a secret vault. And, um, the secret vault I'm gonna use is called Secret Store. Secret Store is a secret vault that is owned and supported by the PowerShell team. It's a local secret vault that uses um, the .NET Core cryptographic APIs, it's stored on the file system, and it's supported everywhere PowerShell is. Um, I also have that one installed already, so I'm gonna go ahead and register it. So I'm gonna use register secret vault. Um, you can see I'm gonna use my predictors I'm gonna use a name, friendly name is My Secrets, module name is Microsoft PowerShell Secret Store, and I'm gonna set it as my default vault. Now that I have it registered, I can go get Secret Vault and see that I have it stored. Now I can set my first secret. I'm gonna use Set Secret to create my first secret. I'll call it My Secret. And if I go ahead and um, Hit enter, I can provide a secret as a secure string on the command prompt. Say hello. Um, now if I do get secret, my secret, it'll return it to me um, as a secure string, or I can get it as plain text, and you can see it returned my secret. Um, if I wanna see my secret metadata, I can do get secret info, 
and you can see my secrets. Um, now I'm ready to start using my secrets um, in my scripts. Um, one final thing I'll show is that there are a number of secret, other Secret Vault extensions available on the PowerShell gallery. So if I do find PS resource, um, tag uh, secret management, I can see all of the Secret Vault extensions um, available on the PowerShell gallery. And one that I will highlight is the Azure Key Vault extension, which is supported by the Azure Key Vault team. Um, there also are a number of community um, extension vaults out there. And with that, I will pass things over to Steve. Right. Jason, oh man, I got it all wrong. Don't go far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> What is it? What's it? Oh, cool, 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 cool. So, um, hey everyone, how y'all doing? Yeah, now, now for the really screwed up demos, right? So, uh, uh, first of all, let me, um, uh, I, I have the fortunate privilege of, of being a PM on the uh, PowerShell team, but also um, as a PM for Cloud Shell. So I just kind of, well now that just did not work out the way that I wanted. So let me just go up here. And I just want to show you uh, uh, Cloud Shell for a second because I want you to think about something. See if I get lucky here. And I want you to notice something that I'm going to go up to this. I know it's hard to see on the screen, but I just want you to see that one third of Azure Portal's front page is a tool for you to manage Azure with. Kind of cool. You get your choice of flavors, Batch or PowerShell. It's got always up-to-date tools. So why do all of a sudden I sound like Jim Kirk? It's got always up-to-date tools, which means Azure PowerShell. It's already up-to-date. You don't have to download the modules. We've already taken care of that for you. AZCLI for both Bash and PowerShell. Remember, PowerShell runs native commands just fine. So you use AZCLI there. We're about to add AZ developer commands, and we're adding so many more tools, and it's always up-to-date there for you, and you can get to this to manage your environment anywhere, anytime, from any device. Now, we realize that there are some things that might make your life even a little bit easier, and we're working on them. First of all, over this year, you're gonna see something called Ephemeral Sessions come out. Cloud Shell that doesn't need a storage account. A lot of folks are really looking forward to that. Also, oh, cool, awesome. The other thing is, is that you're gonna see some other things come out like those of you that may have worked with VNet configurations, we're improving VNets, and we've got a new UX that we're rolling out, but what's gonna be really interesting and what I'd really like to talk to you folks about, especially if you come to Michael Bender's session this afternoon on Cloud Shell, is the future forward roadmap of how we are thinking about and how we might like to make investments in Cloud Shell to make it a better daily driver for you. So. Check out Cloud Shell when you get a chance. That was my Cloud Shell thing. There you go. Leave. <sighs> oh, I just use this prompt since it's nice and big. Something else, and if you get a chance, oh, I'll tell you that in a second. How many of you, uh, how many of you use platform-specific native commands? I know that's a string of words, but basically means how many of you run things like Docker or ipconfig? You know those those things that are not commandlets. Okay, I was kind of hoping you all put your hands up. Now, here's one of the problems is, is when you run those commands, uh, IP config. The text that comes out of here is arbitrary text. You can't do anything useful with this. In fact, if I try to go up here and go, well, let's just pipe this to select object because I want the IP4 address. <laughs> no, can't utilize it. Well, here's what we've done. And if you come to a session on Wednesday, I'm gonna tell you more about it. Crescendo allows you to take native commands and make, whoops, <laughs> make them look like commandlets. Get IP config. Oh, oh, that's a much prettier display, but here's the best part. It's not only a prettier display. Hey, by the way, thanks for all the colors on the columns and stuff, man. It's not only a prettier display, but the best part is, is I can, of course, they're objects. So you can now work with them. So on Wednesday, I got an offer for you. Come see us in Crescendo. Who's gonna be here? Jim Truer, who's the engineer for Crescendo. But some of you may know Jim Truer as one of the original developers on PowerShell. So if you wanna ask him anything, this is a really good time to do it while he's here on Wednesday. 
Um, so check that out as well. Um, something else, and this is, Sean, this is your fault. Um, it's not your fault. This is thanks to you. Uh, I can't believe that. Guys, we, uh, Stephen was showing you we've got all these logs and, you know, stuff you can check and, you know, see what's going on and what's new. And, you know, you get, we, we ship a preview every month. Plus, we have releases every year. We've got long-term service releases, actual, you know, releases, previews. We ship so much stuff, you might be confused. What does any of this stuff do? Well, I would encourage you to go to our documentation, which is called What's New. And of course, you can always check the change logs, but now in PowerShell, you can just type get what's new. And that will list for you. I, my, my, my display has exploded here, so apologies for, you can't really read it there. But this is giving me a list of what's new in the current version that I'm sitting on. I'm sitting here thinking, we had written our demos out here, and I can't read a thing on this page. And I was sitting there going, how am I going to remember all of those get what's new things I was going to show you? Well, I think I want to show it to you this way. Hey, folks, if you're not using predictive IntelliSense and PS Readline, it does more for you than you think. Right now, I have no idea what I used to successfully type using, you know, with get what's new. Well, I'm going to hit F2, and it's just going to remind me of it. So I don't even have to remember. So I'm just going to show you from here. Get what's new has a couple of options. Yes, you can specify a version parameter and tell it, show me what's new for that version. Whee! It also has a daily switch, which means it'll give you one thing from that list as a message of the day. You can shove that into your prompt, rock on, and have some fun that way. You can also go directly online, which will take you to our docs. <gasps> kind of cool. All right. And I think, oh, one other thing when I wanted to show you while I was here was, um, how can I show this to you? I'm just trying to think, uh, get, uh, this is, uh, no, that's not good. Uh, I'll think of something here. Let's, no, that's not going to help. Get process. I've got to have something. Oh, this will work. So, oh, I ran it. I didn't mean to run it, but let me show you something. Um, and, and if I had a longer line, this would make sense. We've added some additional things in a PS Reline that many of you may not know about. We refer to it internally as dynamic help, but essentially it means this. First of all, watch what I'm going to do. I know it's hard to see, but I'm going to put my cursor over where the commandlet is. Gee, I wish I knew what this commandlet did. Gee, I wish I knew what the parameter options were. Gee, I wish I knew how this thing worked in a pipeline. Gee, hit F1 and it'll show you. Should I do that again? Guys, you don't have to type get help and open up a separate console or go out to the web and bring up the docs. All you have to do is put your cursor on the command line, hit F1, boom, there's the full help documentation. It's in a separate virtual. All right, but wait, wait, wait. I'm going to go over here to the parameter and I'm going to hit F1 and it takes you right to the parameter help. <laughs> Couple of other things though, let me get rid of this here. Uh, let me just show you, when you have a lot of commands, pipelines and all that, and you need to get to the argument that was like, you know, 300 characters backwards or whatever, and you got a cursor back and all this. Um, now we give you something called Alt-A, which automatically hops to the arguments in your command so you can change them. And one of the other favorite things I have is um, Alt-H, which gives you that specific parameter help for pipelining, tells you what it does for pipelining. So check out the dynamic help features um, that we have uh, for it. I think F1 is probably one of my, my favorite features of all time. And now there's one more thing I think I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to blame you, Steve. Oh, huh? Oh, Sean. <laughs> Thanks for the prompt, bro. So what Sean is trying to get to is the reason I'm showing you about dynamic help right now is because we have now a new article, thank you, Stephen, thank you, Sean, a new article on PS Readline of how to get all of the key bindings the same from Windows to Mac. Some of, think about this, I have muscle memory, right? Alt-A, Alt-H. When you go to Mac, you can't use alt keys unless you modify the terminal. Well, what terminal do you use? I don't know, it's different for everyone. <laughs> so. What we want you to do is this. Steven created an article that explains for different terminals how quickly and easily you can support alt keys on Mac and Linux, and then you can create your own bindings that are the same between cross-platform Windows and Mac so that 
your fingers do the right thing no matter where you are. That article, Sean? So, Bing, Google, whatever you want to do to using PS read line key. Uh, let's see if that gets me close enough. Oh, there it is. And so there's the article. Go out, check it out. This could make your life, it certainly made my life a lot easier. Yeah? Kind of cool? All right. I think I only have one other thing to do here, except I can't find my sheet, but it says Steve. So maybe I come back maybe to you come later. Back. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me just add one more thing to this last topic real quick. So due to a limitation in .NET, um, that's the reason why it's hard to have consistent um, key modifiers across Windows and non-Windows. But my understanding is that's supposed to be fixed in .NET 8, which is what PowerShell 7.4 is based on. So that should enable you to have like different alt control and uh, different modifiers. So let me just remind myself. Oh, all right. This is the DSC one, ignore this for now. That's a different session. All right. All right. I have to use code for my, wait, where is oh, this one? All right, so the first thing I wanna show is really kind of like a story. Uh, oh, make it bigger. Yeah. Here, why don't you make it bigger while, while I talk? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> So, so one of the, the challenges I think people have had with mixing like native commands and, and partial commandlets is when things don't work, you don't necessarily get a consistent experience on how you handle those errors. So let me, okay. So in this example, and I need to go into Steve folder, I believe. So this is like just a very simple script. And it, by, by design, it has an error in it, right? So it's gonna get command on this thing. And if I run it, uh, this is zero. Then you'll see, you know, it's gonna complain, but it actually continues to execute because it's a non-terminating error. So it's gonna hit the second line and you may or may not want that to happen. So, so usually what you would do is, to fix your production scripts, you really wanna kinda of have this error action prep and stop on the top. Therefore, if anything bad happens, you're not gonna continue processing and get unpredictable behavior. So in this case, if we run the second one, now, um, with, if you can see the top part here, stop, it means that when this fails, it's actually a terminating error, so this line four actually doesn't get executed. So everything's good, but now you decide that, you know what, you wanna also add some uh, native commands into your script. So here, if I run two, then you kinda have the same problem where, or a different problem where it's gonna fail, but it's not, oh, it's not failing the way you want it. Uh, actually, do I have, let me check something real quick. This is the problem, you read me my demo. All right, let me run that again. This is two. Uh, oh, thank you. Someone fixed my script because I was uh, developing this on a Mac. All right, now I was doing what I want, I think. Yes, so, okay, so it ran the IP config, uh, which was incorrect, so it aired out, but it continued execution, right? So that's not what I want in my production scripts. I want to err early, fail fast. So the way you would do that normally uh, in classic PowerShell is you would check last exit code. That means that every time um, you have a native command, you gotta test, test the last exit code, was it zero, non-zero? And I'm not gonna run this because I'm gonna take up too much time here. But then the next step, the next evolution that people do is they, they say, all right, I have all these native commands, and so I'm gonna now write this helper function that's gonna take care of this. Uh, here's an example here that I wrote. And when it's non-zero, I'm gonna throw an exception. So now, you know, it, it kind of does what you want. So long story short, we finally fixed this with this uh, new PS native command to use interaction preferences. It's very verbose, but it describes what it does. And if you set it to true, that means that it's gonna respect the interaction preference. So let me run this one here. And basically what happens is that PowerShell engine now is gonna check the exit code for native commands. And again, this needs to be IP config for this to show correctly. So it says, you know, exit with a non uh, zero exit code, is, uh, in this case it's one, so it's gonna stop execution, right? So the idea here is if you have a, a large script with a mix of commandlets and native uh, commands, you can just stick this on top uh, and now if, a native command uh, fails, meaning specifically non-zero exit code, there are native commands that have uh, success with positive uh, non-zero exit codes, then it's gonna stop execution. So that's that item. 
I have so much on here. All right, I think the next thing I was gonna show was really the PS style work. So you kind of saw, um, in fact, here's an example where there's a lot of color on the screen. And you know, I, I think it's part of the theme of making the user more productive in the console. I think color and decoration can definitely help. So one of the things we added uh, in PowerShell is this thing called PS style. It's a built-in variable. You see there's a lot of output here. Um, there's a couple of different things I want to quickly touch on. Uh, if you want to like, create a string and you want to have, let's say, part of it be a different color, so here I might say uh, PS style, foreground, green. Of course, it, it, I get type completion for all this. I can do hello, and then I'll do another PS style. I'll just do background, I don't know, magenta plus, um, I can make it italic. Oh, I didn't type text. <laughs> all right, uh, of course it's like, now stuck in that, but I can do a PS style reset to get back to uh, removing all the decoration. But you can get the idea, right? You can also put this in your formatters. And that's one of the things that we did here. So if I do get module, oh, that's too wide. Yeah, I can do get process instead. Right, so that, that's where all this color stuff comes from. And everything here is user definable. So if you don't like the choices that were made, then if you go into formatting, you can see like, uh, and these are the raw ANSI escape sequences, but for example here, if I didn't like the green, then I could do something like formatting uh, table header, and then I could do something like foreground, let's make it cyan plus, let's make it bold. So now if I do the same command, oh, there's a different thing I need to talk about real quick. So you can kind of see that. There's this part here, which may be kind of hard to see because it's designed intentionally uh, very subtle, is this thing called custom table header label. Um, one of the feedback we got from users is they're gonna run something like get process and they'll see these uh, green ones, right? And they'll try to now do something like, you know, if they store this in a variable p dot npm k, something like this. And that's not gonna work because this is actually not a real property on the object. This is just something that was created in the formatting to kind of present it in a way. So what you're seeing here with this green italics is basically any uh, formatting uh, column um, that is actually synthesized, like it's not really on the object, is actually gonna show up differently. So that's what this custom table, he table header label indicates. So you can, of course, customize that yourself to uh, however you want it. The last part, because I'm probably taking too much time here, is this file info. So again, like in here, you can kind of see like the folders are this color. I know some people don't like it, but you can change it yourself. Um, but let's say that I want to make uh, markdown files a different color, right? So under the file info, the extension is just a hash table. So I can actually, I can do this. Oh, thank you. This is why Sean's here. He's <laughs> catching all these live mistakes. All right, so you want to do the extension MD, and then again, I'm going to use a PS style. Let's do, um, I don't know, what's interesting? Let's, Let's do blue, I guess. And now if I do a dir, then you can kind of see, again, you have to do like bold and all those other things to make it more brighter. But you have, you have fully customizable, you can add your own extensions. Uh, the only other thing that worth mentioning here. Um, by default, directories, symlinks, and executables uh, are cut out specially because they don't have extensions. And let me just make sure that I miss, I think that was, I think it was going back to Cool, yeah. Back to me. Um, and so one last thing we want to show off is something that's uh, very, very new and so new we had to have a custom build of PowerShell on this machine in order to, to show it off. So it's not yet available in preview, but it should be coming soon. Um, so I saw a big raise of hands, oh yeah, thank you, um, uh, earlier about who uses native executables. And have you ever, have anyone tried piping native executables to other native executables before? and had that just absolutely barf at you in Windows? Me too, yeah. So that's something that we're working on and we have, uh, let me just double check, I am, okay, yeah. URI, there we go, a little bigger, okay. Um, so I'm just sending a variable for a, UR, a URI to uh, one of our PowerShell releases and I wanna show off how now uh, with this new change we can now pipe native executables between each other. So I'm going to actually uh, do this. I will use predictive IntelliSense to help me out here. 
and uh, get this. So um, previously, uh, this well, actually, let's, let me let me show you it uh, before what what it would what it would do before. So uh, URI here we go here curl. Let me do the pipe first. So if I tried doing this, if I tried curling this URL and then compressing it with tar, you'll see it just is thinking and thinking until eventually it's gonna barf at me. And so um, you know this, this is frustrating, especially uh, for users who might be more familiar with these or native commands. But now if I do it here in this latest change, it just works. That's pretty awesome, right? Right? Come on. <laughs> Um, so this has been a long-standing request, and the cool thing is it also works with uh, just uh, normal byte streams too. So if I do uh, invoke web request URI, and I get the content of it, so this is just a byte stream, I can now tar this as well, xcbf, and this will work as well. So if you uh, have PowerShell commandlets that output a byte stream and want to pipe it to native command, that's just going to work too. And that's pretty awesome. I'm going to actually cancel this before I absolutely use up all the disk space here. But um, <laughs> um, uh, the cool thing too, it, this also works for redirection. So you might have seen this earlier. I will go here. So this works for redirection here. And so now I can uh, download something with curl and redirect it to a file here uh, pretty simply. And um, this will now uh, work. So once this goes, take a minute to download. It's a PowerShell re release, so it's not too tiny. And now if I do get child item, you'll see there it is now in, uh, and it was just written uh, right, right then here. So um, yeah, so I think that's all we have for demos. Oh yeah. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention in the PS style demo, because I see Sean sitting in front of me here. Uh, <laughs> he, he actually did some great work and created a module on the PowerShell gallery uh, to support Windows PowerShell. So if you want to have uh, scripts that work across both PowerShell 7 and Windows PowerShell, and of course Linux and Windows, and use PS style to add coloring and decoration, he has a module, I think it's just called PS style, um, and you can get that off of the gallery. Cool. Awesome, so I think uh, we'll go back to the presentation. And um, so let, let, let's talk a little bit about what you guys have been up to, the PowerShell community. Um, give a raise, has anyone contributed to the PowerShell repo in any way? Give a raise of hands. We've got a few hands here and there. Um, well, we have an amazing community of contributors and we wanted to highlight that. And so um, first I wanna talk a little bit about uh, PowerShell's growth. So, uh, you know, it's a little hard to see the numbers, but we, we started collecting uh, telemetry around PowerShell 7 sessions in November of 2020. And last year, in April of 2022, we had 600 million sessions running um, and th for that month alone. That's, that's pretty crazy, right? Well, it didn't stop there. Uh, if we, kept, we kept growing and growing throughout uh, the remainder of 2022 until in October, we hit, we hit our first billion sessions run in a single month. We're like McDonald's, a billion served. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Give a shout out, come on. This is you. This is you using PowerShell. Its growth is phenomenal. This is you. It's amazing. Yeah, so it, it's just fantastic. Uh, the, the growth has just been absolutely exponential. And I'll just you know highlight here, today, we, in the month of March, we had 1.3 billion sessions run, an all-time all record, which is absolutely amazing. So uh, give yourself a round of applause for just the amazing. Um, now, of course, we, we got to give a shout out to some of our main, uh, some of our biggest community contributors. You may see uh, your GitHub username up there too. These are some of our top contributors, be it issues, be it PRs, uh, be it docs contributions, uh, we, we love to see community contributions. We've been now doing a, a dedicated community day every Monday where we as a PowerShell team spend the whole day focused on community issues and community PRs so that we can make sure that your work is being looked at and uh, added to PowerShell. 
Um, so we wanted to just give a big, big shout out to our community contributors. I mean, this only encapsulates just a small fraction of the number of people who contribute to PowerShell. This last year alone, we had over 3,000 PRs uh, since last summit. And we had over 2,000 issues submitted since last summit too. I mean, overall, we have almost over 12,000 issues that have been submitted to, to PowerShell and across all of our repos, which is just phenomenal. And so uh, uh, pretty we, it's, it's pretty amazing. So, um, and so. Well, and as you can imagine, with all those issues coming in, you know, we have over 100 repos that we're responsible for, that we got to keep track of the issues and all that kind of stuff. PowerShell alone. Huge amounts of issues, just as Stephen was pointing out. So what happened is we, we, we get a little bit behind. It's a lot of work to go through, analyze, make sure we investigate the issues, looking at the PRs. It's not something that happens like this. You can't make decisions on this kind of important level of things that quickly, so it takes time. Well, to help us get through this, again, you actually helped us out. There's a lot of community members working with PowerShell team members in the working groups. And what the working groups do is they go out through these issues and they go through to triage them. Sometimes they can you know, help somebody with the issue, give them a workaround, point them in a direction. Sometimes it's an issue that needs to get into the team. This way, because of these wonderful people, they've helped reduce what an engineer needs to look at and think about, we've been able to move more efficiently. And so I'd like to thank all of the work group members and I would encourage you if you'd like to become a working group member to help us out, it's an important process to working with the community so that we can move forward. And of course, we have our PowerShell gallery, which is so important to us, our community repository. So raise your hands. Who's ever used the PowerShell gallery yet and downloaded a module? And uh, raise your hands. Who's ever contributed a module? Quite a few in the room. That's amazing. Um, today, we have over 11,000 unique packages on the PowerShell gallery and over 200,000 total packages. We have about um, over 300 million monthly downloads and over 8 billion total downloads on the gallery. So just a huge amount of traffic through that site. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. The truth of the matter is this. If Steven says, I want you to talk about SSH, and I don't do SSH. Danny does SSH. And I says, well, I'll talk about SSH. And Steven says, no, you got to talk about what's on the screen, because you don't want to talk about anything else. And I says, well, why not? Why can't I talk about it? Because Danny doesn't trust you. So here's the deal. <laughs> Over 4 million total GitHub uh, downloads for uh, SSH, 54,000 uh, of them in the uh, last version alone. And on Wednesday, you want to know more about what's going on with SSH, and you do, please go see Danny's session where he's going to be, a, he's going to go through, he's going to talk to you about all the stuff, which I'm not going to talk about because I'll screw it up. So go see Danny's session on SSH, yeah? yeah. Danny, stand up so we, so everyone oh, can see you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> he's the tall one. <laughs> so anything SSH, go find Danny. He would love to talk to you about open SSH uh, stuff there. And, uh, so we have a bit of an announcement. So um, a while ago, we had a public dashboard where you can kind of track along some of the PowerShell usage. And uh, it, it, it broke. Lots of backend pipelines broke. Some data things got deprecated. It was kind of a headache. Uh, I've spent a long time kind of working out uh, a lot of those issues and now have uh, fixed the public dashboard so you can follow uh, along with the PowerShell progress as well as uh, top community contributors. So you can go to aka.ms slash PS public dashboard and now you can follow along with the insane growth that PowerShell has been having these last few years. I mean, you know, in the last two years, we've, we've just exponentially increased the number of PowerShell sessions as well as the PowerShell nodes that are being used. Um, and community contributions are at an all-time high and so we want to continue uh, to, to help encourage this kind of growth and we want you guys to have the ability to follow along with this growth uh, with us. So uh, feel free to check out that, that dashboard um, and if there's anything you want to know more about PowerShell telemetry, any data you want to talk about, please feel free to talk to me. I'm very happy to talk about uh, that sort of stuff. And we will be here all week. Uh, yes, really, we will be here all week. Um, and what I'm really excited about, about this list of sessions that we will be here for, is that it will not just be um, your friendly PM, but we have convinced quite a few of our lovely dev friends to join us for these sessions, yeah. which is very exciting. 
So today, be sure to check out Jason and Steve Ooh. talking all things DSC V3 at two o'clock. Um, and then not only Steven, who's amazing and wonderful, but the one and only Dongbo yes. will also be there at 3.15 to talk about shell enhancements. Um, tomorrow, um, I will be there at one o'clock um, to talk about the VS Code extension, but I will also be joined by Andy, um, which is very exciting. On Wednesday, we've got, once again, Danny, woo, <laughs> um, talking about SSH, um, and Jason. Come see Jim Truer. And Jim Truer, um, talking about Crescendo. And then finally, on Thursday, we have Sean, talking about all things Doc. So a very exciting agenda all week long. Um, don't hesitate to come up and talk to us all week. Yeah, please feel free to just come up and say hi, introduce yourself, and let's let's talk about PowerShell and how it's how it's helping you in your work. We'd love to hear about it. And finally, a few calls to action. Um, yes, this is the PowerShell hero as a dog. Um, AI generated, right? We didn't make this. <laughs> yeah. Please make it AI generated. <laughs> I'd love to see all your like different AI generated versions of the PowerShell hero this week. Um, but also. Thank you for um, attending State of the Shell today. I hope you enjoy the conference. Um, yeah, a few last agenda items today. Please um, install the latest version of PowerShell. We shipped um, 7.4 Preview 3 just last week. You can get it at aka.ms slash get PowerShell. And please stay in touch with us. Yes, this week, come and talk to us. We're very friendly, I promise. Um, but also beyond the conference, um, join us at our community call. Um, we jump on that call the third Thursday at, of every month at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. Virtually the entire PowerShell engineering team joins, as well as a number of amazing community members who come and give demos. That's the best place to get the latest announcements from the team. Um, also, do follow along our team blog. That's where we post announcements when we release things. Um, and feel free to follow us along on Twitter. Now, one more last thing before um, I can pass along to the organizers and probably release you for lunch. I think we wanted to get a selfie. Um, yeah. yeah. Steven? Try yeah. to do a selfie. We, we like to do a selfie just to show off the amazing community of, of PowerShell. Yeah, feel free to throw up the PowerShell. The reminder is the V goes on your left hand. That's how I remember it, yes. but yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, come on, throw it! <laughs> You don't know how to throw it, you don't believe it. Where did Jason go? <laughs> He's trying to get Bill to do the hand signal. Right. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great conference. <laughs>